And here we are again, viewer, at the precipice of another great journey. What if I told you that before us there existed a civilization that was responsible for the most advanced technology ever developed, and that it was their understanding of the workings of our flat realm that was key to their innovation? And what if I told you that it is highly likely that our true history as a people only begun just over 200 years ago? Would you think of me as mad once again? It's okay. You're okay. You're awake now. You were having a nightmare. We crashed en route to Siberia. We were attacked and went down. I thought I'd lost you for a minute. <sighs> I have no idea where we are. An unknown coastline somewhere. And this is going to take some time to repair. I have been working on it ever since. But as the sun departs, and darkness comes, now is the time for rest. We cannot waste time, but now we're forced to. Let's get settled for the evening. I have broadly introduced the story I am trying to tell, the story that refutes his story, but please forgive me, we have only covered the basics. Which means that up until this point, our investigation into our lost history has been lacking nuance. I need to draw out the complexities for you. And this means there will be some unexpected developments and turns in the plot of our story. I really hope you don't mind, viewer. But as we move forward, we will also need to revisit topics, such as the old structures and the mud. I must admit, our journey is going to be a long one. But now look at us, forced into limbo, on this unknown shoreline, a temporary purgatory. This is a good time to tell you a story. The Great Flood, or the Great Deluge, is a story that looms on the historical horizon of so many cultures. The story of Noah is perhaps the most famous, but there are many forms of this story. We have the Noah that appears in the Quran. We have the Hindu legend of Manu, we have the Mesopotamian myths of Gilgamesh and Sumerian creation. We have the ancient Greek story of Deucalion. In fact, there is such an abundance of different renditions of the Great Flood that listing them would be a great waste of time. But it's useful to note because a multitude of similar so-called myths all describing a mass flood event like this do not just appear out of nowhere. Compiling your very own flood myth was not a rite of passage for each individual culture. This event obviously took place at some point in our history. And so many of the narratives share the similar premise. God, or the gods, are unhappy with humans. One human is warned and instructed to build a vessel to survive while the rest perish in the waters. Whether these different renditions were constructed deliberately to hide the truth or whether they formed in a more organic manner 
I cannot say, but they all provide a clear indication of the what. A great worldwide flood that eradicated and reset life on Earth. What they do not provide, however, is a clear indication of the why. Why did this happen? Apart from one of these texts, if read closely and correctly, and lucky for us, this text is one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written. You hear me speak of God often, the creator of the realm, and it no doubt raises the question, if God is real, then why are there resets in the first place? From the moment we develop our capabilities to learn, we are prescribed a prism, a small cocoon if you will, that takes hold deep within our minds and begins to grow. It is nourished and fed by the mandated education system imposed upon us and reinforced by the social circles we keep. By the time we enter adulthood, more often than not, the shell of the cocoon will have fully broken and the opportunistic wings of the creature inside emerge and begin to wrap around and smother our minds. We are trained to see reality in a certain way and more often than not, the perception produced by this prism is not correct and filters our experience and understanding of the world into a type of disreality. It's a very strong prism and many never escape its grip. And this can have serious consequences. In some way or another, we are all sheep, but it's our choice of shepherd that defines our path. Actions have consequences, and it is always a tragic affair when we are forced to learn lessons just a little too late. We do not have the ability to reset ourselves, to wind back our own personal clock and erase our mistakes and poor choices. We must live with the consequences of our actions. Once upon a time in our realm's history, there lived a man named Enoch. He was a descendant of a lineage that can be traced back to Adam, the same Adam that God placed in the Garden of Eden. Enoch had a son named Methuselah. Enoch, we are told, was a righteous man and walked with God. His son Methuselah had his own son named Lamech, and Lamech fathered a very interesting man named Noah. We have all heard of the great flood in which Noah survived. He built an ark. He labored on this ark for a long time and warned others of a coming flood who, in their stubborn arrogance, shunned and ignored his warnings. His cry, a tremendous black cloud that filled the sky, but the message rained down on deaf ears. They would not listen to him. The flood destroyed pretty much all life on earth, but Noah and his bloodline survived. And it's in discussions of the event known as the Great Flood that we inevitably come up against the workings of the prism holding so many people's minds hostage. Many will dismiss a reset of such a cataclysmic scale as nothing more than mere mythology. It's just too unfathomable to comprehend. Some who think of themselves as smarter than they actually are will use it as an opportunity to dismiss God. If God is good, why would he choose to destroy all of humanity? They will huff, puff and scoff and conclude that no, scriptural accounts of history are not rooted in any kind of fact, but a fiction dreamt up to control and scare the masses into obedience. Not only is this incorrect, but it reveals a deep-seated ignorance in the person that is not entirely their fault. They are missing an understanding of the events that we are told were responsible for causing the flood in the first place. One of the best kept theological secrets is that the Bible used and distributed by the modern church is not the original Bible. Up until the late 19th century, or what is better termed the concluding stages of the Great Reset, the King James Bible came with additional books collected and referred to as the Apocrypha. 
and these were officially purged from the English printings of the King James Bible in 1885. But the purging of books from the Bible began a long time before 1885. And while I do not think the actual events took place in a way they tell us, or at the time they tell us it happened, a quick summary paints the picture well. Christianity and scripture fell victim and into the hands of the Roman Empire around the 4th century, we are told. Under Emperor Constantine, Christianity was fused with many of the pagan practices of Rome. Under his reign, the empire formed a strong alliance with the church. The laws and policies of the empire and the doctrine of the church became a synonymous entity. Through a series of councils, Constantine, his peers and successors successfully began thwarting and eliminating whatever did not fit him with their vision. They began institutionalizing beliefs and practices that did not exist before but which have remained a cornerstone in the teaching of the church today. And despite what some historians claim, this would have brought on an inevitable process of distortion and redaction of scripture itself. There are hundreds of books missing from the original collection known as the Bible. Some have suggested that originally the Bible contained well over 500 books. It now contains 66, their favorite number, a very important number. The missing books are now referred to as the lost books. The Apocrypha is not the entirety of the lost books, it is a handful. Lost is an interesting word. It was coined, we are told, in the 1300s. Its original definition is wasted, ruined, spent in vain. It stems from the Old English, loss, which means destruction. The books are not lost, they were either destroyed or hidden. They are the forbidden books of the Bible. It needs to be emphasized once more. During the Great Reset, the controllers established the major religions that now govern and influence our world. This is imperative to understand. It does not mean that people did not worship God before or that the scriptures are entirely illegitimate. It means they have thwarted our historical ancestors' understanding of our world and God. It means they have redacted huge portions of text, hidden entire books, and used religious organizations to manipulate and yoke together practices that did not exist before. An example of which is Sunday worship. The Roman Empire fused Christianity with the pagan worship of the sun, which resulted in the Sabbath changing from Saturday to Sunday. More on this later. And some would reason that if the controllers have faked so much history and continually subjected us to PSYOP after PSYOP, then why should we trust anything that was written and collected into the Bible or any text for that matter? It is a very valid question and one I have considered for a long time. It's almost impossible to discern what is a genuine historical artifact and what is fraudulent and they have been caught faking artifacts over and over again. We only have our eyes, so what do we see? We see the controllers and their puppets again and again trying to steer people away from the scriptures. To pollute the minds of the young and convince millions that they are nothing more than a mythological collection of stories wrought together by our ancient and primitive ancestors who were trying to make sense of the world around them. If the scriptures were a fraudulent fiction, why the effort to prevent people from considering them? And why do we see with our own eyes again and again masons and other controller puppets refusing to swear on the bible why don't you swear on the bible that you walked on the moon you're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't calling the kettle black if you ever thought of it. say that you misrepresented get myself. away from me you're a coward and a liar and a thief why wouldn't the astronauts who have lied to the world over and over again and participated in one of the greatest lies of all time 
not just commit another dishonest act and place their dirty hands on the Bible and swear that they landed on the moon. They won't do it, which is strange. Do they fear this act more than lying about their little journey into the great fiction of space? Are there consequences that come with placing your hand on a text like this and taking an oath? And then there is the almost mind-boggling presence and prevalence of demon worship that has spread throughout our world and that stems from those in high places. And it is mind-boggling, especially if you are asleep and see the world through your prescribed prism. Are they just insane? Are they just being edgy? Maybe it's all just a coincidence. But those awake see a little more clearly. It is not mind-boggling. It all makes sense. The controllers do not want people turning to God or going near the scriptures with serious intentions. And they've hidden many texts to stop people finding out the truth. But God works in mysterious ways. And there do exist many fragments, some much more comprehensive than others, of these lost books. Some were discovered during and after the Great Reset and have been made accessible. The controllers love control, but they do not have full control. They also adore hiding things in plain sight. To hide something in plain sight, even if it goes unnoticed by the recipient, is akin to receiving informed consent, and this is very important. And I understand that many will not consider anything outside of the established canonical King James selection as potentially legitimate. But again, this is another prism, and it has kept many rooted in not coming closer to the truth. In this sense, the Reformation, or the great redaction of scripture, has been a success. But I also understand the hesitancy regarding extra scriptural texts or forgotten fragments and the susceptibility for these to be fraudulent or forgeries. And that's why it is necessary to cross-reference these texts with the books contained within the canonical Bible. It is also important to cross-reference them with other religious texts and historical accounts. So what could have happened to have caused a major worldwide flood, which eradicated pretty much all of humanity? If the skeptics knew, then perhaps they would not be so dismissive. The animals came in two by two hurrah is not the truth of the matter. The period of time in which Enoch, Methuselah and Noah belong to has been termed antediluvian. Anti is a prefix meaning before, and diluvian stems from the Latin diluvium, which means a flood. So what was this period in time actually like? Chapter 6 of Genesis offers a very succinct summary. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. The verses found within Genesis chapter 6 are truly some of the most fascinating in the entire Bible. And again, that number, chapter 6. The passage is fascinating for many reasons, but primarily because one, 
it summarizes an entire historical epoch very briefly. We hear about the sons of God and giants being born, and then the narrative moves on swiftly. And two, because we are told that God was unhappy with the state of humanity and decided to destroy and reset the earth. Everything you need to know is contained within this chapter, but the prism implanted in our minds from a very young age will only process what it allows us to see. The mention of non-humans or the sons of God, the mention of giants and the destruction of the earth. The prism processes this information for the individual and they conclude, ah, a mythological story. The animals came in two by two, hurrah. And the brevity of the passage really prevents the curious from going further. We are introduced to a very specific historical era where non-humans bred with human women and produce mighty beings, the men of renown. And then the flood comes and the entire account moves on. And the inquiring mind wants to shout, no, wait, tell me more. What happened during this time period? Who are the sons of God? Why was the entire earth corrupt? And giants, you say. But if we turn our attention to the book of Enoch, then we start to see the brushstrokes that compose this scriptural picture of the antediluvian world a bit more clearly. In 1616, Sir Walter Riley wrote his history of the world while imprisoned in the Tower of London, or so we are told. It makes reference to the book of Enoch which was discovered during this period in Ethiopia and translated from the Giez. Aramaic and Hebrew fragments of the book were also discovered in the Qumran caves in the Judean desert. They are now referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. There also exist some Greek fragments of the text. And the text is a very important one because, whether divinely inspired or not, or whether it's just another Masonic half-truth kind of text, it provides much insight into the antediluvian period that Genesis references and expands on the necessity of the flood. It also provides insight into the workings of the luminaries and the prophetic millennial reign of the coming Messiah. As the first book of Enoch, the book of Watchers recounts, and it came to pass, when the children of men have multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and begat us children. And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. They descended on the children of men and took wives, and they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants whose height was three thousand L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. As you can see, the passages recounting the birth of giants or what have subsequently come to be known as the Nephilim are very similar to Genesis 6. Interestingly, it is also chapter 6 of Enoch that begins its account of the interbreeding between the children of heaven and the children of men and the resulting birth of giants. We will return to the importance of this number soon. But the book of Enoch provides just a little more insight than Genesis. Here we see a faction of beings from the heavenly realm, or what are referred to as angels, swearing an oath to commit genetic miscegenation. Genetic miscegenation is the interbreeding between species. 
and my use of the term here strictly refers to just that, the mixing of genetics between different species, i.e. humans with animals and other beings such as an angel. And it is here that the prism will inevitably stir once again. When we hear the word angel, our prism immediately produces an image like this. This is carefully wrought programming that has been installed in the reader since a very young age, propagated by religious institutions, national holidays, and other cultural mediums. No one truly knows what an angelic being looks like, and the notion of another realm, a heavenly realm, sounds just as absurd as an angelic being. But this does not mean there is not any truth in these words. The angels are led by a specific angel called Semjaza. The Book of Enoch lists over 18 of these angelic leaders and calls them the Chiefs of Tens. And the text informs us that over 200 of these beings descended with the intention of committing genetic miscegenation. And the manner this is conducted far exceeds the mere enticement of lust. These are not the actions of those desiring human women, but the execution of a well-organized plan, devised with an almost military-like hierarchy of leaders. They must take an oath, because they know once their plan is in action, there is no return. Actions have consequences. And Enoch knew this all too well. In the Book of Visions, he has a nightmare of what's to come. I raised mine eyes towards heaven, and saw a lofty roof, with seven water torrents thereon, and those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. And as I looked at the height of that water, that water had risen above the height of that enclosure, and was streaming over that enclosure. What is clear from both Genesis and the Book of Enoch is that these angelic beings, one, do not have the same genetics as humans. Two, they descended from another realm, what is referred to as the heavenly realm. And three, they were responsible for corrupting human genetics and the result was the birth of enormous hybrid giants. And this is why the flood, as recorded in Genesis and Enoch's nightmare, was a necessity. Because, as Genesis 6 explains, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh has corrupted his way upon the earth. The birth of genetic hybrid giants, or the Nephilim, was not the only act of genetic miscegenation that took place upon the earth. As both Genesis and Enoch makes clear, the hybrid Nephilim began to sin against all life on earth, including birds and beasts and reptiles and fish. The sin here is experimental genetic miscegenation. But why is this a sin? Again, the Bible offers us some clues. The importance of maintaining genetic purity is emphasized throughout scripture and the Mosaic law. Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. In the first week of creation, God established a genetic order for the world. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. The refrain, after his kind, is repeated at least nine times in Genesis 1. The Hebrew term Mayan, which translates as kind here in scripture, refers to a species Maintaining genetic order is critical to God's creative work. The pollution or corruption of the genetic line of all flesh was not the only sin of the fallen angels. As the book of Enoch explains, the angels were also responsible for teaching mankind the eternal secrets which were in heaven, which men were striving to learn, such as making known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them. They schooled mankind in enchantments and root cuttings, astrology, the workings of the constellations, the knowledge of the clouds, the signs of the earth, of the sun, of the moon. And once taught these secrets, which inevitably fell into the hands of the Nephilim hybrids, 
all of humankind began to perish. And questions remain. Primarily, 1. Why didn't God intervene sooner, as the angelic beings descended to the earth with clear, organized intentions of corrupting the genetic order of creation, and thus avoid the flood altogether? And 2. Why is maintaining genetic integrity of utmost importance? Let's address the first question. It is here that most struggle with the concept of God being a good, forgiving and benevolent being. So many cannot wrap their minds around the concept of a benevolent God when there exists such evil and corruption in the world. The answer to this supposed paradox is a very simple one and it is hidden within the code of the Bible and Enoch's bloodline. Like I said before, Enoch fathered a child named Methuselah. Methuselah is a very interesting name. It has become one of my favorite names. Its meaning in the Hebrew is, when he is dead, it shall be sent. And the closer look at the biblical timeline suggests that it is not a coincidence that Methuselah died in the same year that the flood was sent to cleanse earth. The it shall be sent that Methuselah's name refers to is indeed the flood. Renowned theologian A.W. Pink wrote on the enormous implications buried in the meaning of the name Methuselah. Suppose God should say to you, the life of that little one is to be the life of the world. When that child dies, the world will be destroyed. What would be the effect upon you? Every time that child fell sick, the world's doom would stare you in the face. Methuselah went on to live the longest life of any person in the Bible. He died when he was 969 years old. Remember this number. Again, it is of utmost importance. It was Methuselah's death that signaled the coming of the flood. When Methuselah was 187 years old, he fathered Lamech. When Lamech was 182 years old, he fathered Noah. The flood came when Noah was 600 years old, the same year that Methuselah died. A simple maths equation provides us with a genealogical sum of 969. This shows that God provided almost a thousand years for humanity to repent and reject the rebellion of the fallen angels and their Nephilim offspring who were corrupt in the world. Describing Christ's sacrifice, 1 Peter 3 compares his patience to God's in the times of Noah, when once a long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. God waited almost a thousand years for humans to change their ways. My spirit shall not always strive with man, meant that God would give humanity sufficient time, but not unlimited time. And of course, humans did not repent and change. And the skeptical intellect, whose mind is bloated and heavy from holding so much nonsense, will scoff again and say, but surely if God is benevolent and all-powerful, then he would have intervened. Why wait in the first place? No, what really legitimizes the existence of both good and evil is free will. The existence of free will, the ability of humans to make a choice and bear the consequences, is what makes us free. It is true liberty. If God, our creator, intervened and controlled the outcome, then we would not have autonomy. Any creator that restricts the freedom of choice, despite their intentions, is by default a dictator. Furthermore, in a world where evil is prevalent, and the choice to follow or be influenced by such evil lies with the autonomous being, then any intervention before it is truly necessary would be an act that legitimizes evil and places its power status above its counterpart of goodness. To follow the right or wrong path is a choice and must be chosen by the individual. Scripture informs us that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. 
Noah was perfect in his generations because he chose not to succumb to the practices of his peers and follow the path of genetic miscegenation that was being carried out on earth under the leadership of the hybrid Nephilim offspring of the fallen angels. Noah was not without sin, but he walked with God, or in other words, the Lord was his shepherd, and he followed his lead and resisted the false leadership that would eventually lead to the corruption of his genetics. Maintaining genetic integrity, we are told, is an essential component to righteousness. Why? First and foremost is that it obeys God's ordained genealogical hierarchy. We were not created to fuse our genetics with those of other species. And the importance of this becomes evident when we consider the angelic beings, the sons of God. We are told that they descended from another realm, the heavenly realm. Their genetics are fundamentally different from human genetics. And while the notion of different species with different genetics is not hard to grasp, after all we see with our own eyes that the snake, the dolphin and the gorilla all maintain very distinctive genetic structures from each other. And this governs their ability to navigate boldly through the world with different experiences. But the notion of another realm, a heavenly realm however, can be very hard to grasp and this is part of our programming. As children we are taught about worlds and these worlds are represented as planets of spherical mass. But what is interesting is that we are not provided with an alternative world to earth where there is an abundance of life present and that exists and thrives within different biological, chemical, geological and atmospheric conditions. We are alone on our little globe and in our merry-go-round solar system. They have worked very hard to convince us that we are completely alone. But perhaps this is not the case. And despite the heliocentric lies, if there were other worlds or realms, then it is highly likely that the conditions of those realms would be very distinct and the genetics of earthly human life would not be compatible with its environment. And the Bible makes this explicitly clear in drawing a distinction between angelic and human beings. Many have written on the genetic corruption of the antediluvian world outlined in Genesis and I highly recommend pursuing books by theologians Ryan Peterson and A.W. Pink who both offer excellent analysis of many known and lesser known books and verses, some of which I will cover here. In explaining the glorified spiritual body, Paul states, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So also is the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, and so it is written. These passages describe two types of human-like bodies, terrestrial, which belongs to our realm, and celestial, which belongs to another realm. These passages also indicate that both human terrestrial and angelic celestial genetics, although distinct, are also very similar. And this is why angelic human relations in terms of reproduction were possible in the first place. As the passage also states, God gives it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body indicating that angelic beings can indeed reproduce. And as Psalm 78 states, And it had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. We see here that humans are able to eat the same food that angels can eat. In Daniel 8, the prophet encounters the angel Gabriel face to face and describes him as having the appearance of a man. The scriptures have always been very clear in the genetic similarities of both angelic and human beings. 
The key difference being that the human being is of the earth, i.e. is limited to the earth, can decay and die, and the angel is not. My point here is not to argue that the distinction between celestial and terrestrial bodies is the truth. There is, after all, no evidence that celestial bodies exist. My point is to demonstrate that the Bible contains a wealth of information regarding genetics and places genetic corruption as the primary driver behind the Great Flood Reset. And this is what is often severely overlooked when it comes to the Flood. Even in circles that are aware of resets, many attempt to claim that Noah's story is a metaphor for a cyclical recurring natural phenomena that creates worldwide floods within our realm. But they often overlook the scripture's explanation as to why God flooded the realm in the first place. The corruption of genetics between species. The why is always more important than the what. And I can hear the skeptic snigger already. They want to shout that the notion of a celestial body, i.e. everlasting life after death, was invented to control the masses into obedience. Nothing more, nothing less. Just because they talk about celestial bodies does not mean that those that wrote scripture understood genetics. The skeptics who adore and nourish their prism, who fly their own religious flag of science, and who have come to view scripture as nothing more than an old means of control, as an archaic and outmoded view of the world, and as anti-science, should really be redirected to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a truly remarkable passage and a testament to the advanced understanding our historical ancestors possessed in regard to genetics and despite the official narrative. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there were none of them. Psalm 139 displays David's marvel at God's power to create human life. Just as Corinthians states that being sown in a natural body and raised in a celestial body is written, David here acknowledges that before he was sown or born, all his members were written in God's book. This book is DNA, the code that makes life possible in the first place. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is the blueprint of human life, and contemporary scientists acknowledge that DNA is a type of book. DNA consists of the nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. These bases are usually abbreviated as A, G, C, and T, respectively. Just as in a book, these letters are grouped in a specific order to communicate a particular idea or task. Recently, contemporary literary studies have fallen under the spell of reading all texts through the prism of social and identity politics. The account of creation of both Adam and Eve has become problematic for youthful, aspiring feminists in the dusty classrooms of university seminars. Of course, they lament, Eve was created from Adam's rib in the patriarchal, misogynistic past of scripture. But if we toss identity politics aside, we can see the creation for what it is. Eve was created out of Adam's already established genetic code, his rib. It's in the word, deoxyribonucleic acid. Furthermore, it's the ribosomes in our cells that take instructions from the messenger RNA in the body to create the proteins essential for life. Enoch did not die a natural death, but was raptured during his life. He was taken from his natural body and given a celestial body by God and see no more. As Hebrews 11.5 states, By faith Enoch was translated 
not to see death and was not found because God did translate him for before his translation he had been testified to that he had pleased God well that word translation just like Adam's rib it is a direct reference to the workings of human genetics in molecular genetics, translation is the process in which the ribosomes, the molecular machines present within our cells, synthesize proteins after the process of transcription of DNA to RNA in the cell's nucleus. In translation, messenger RNA or mRNA is decoded in the ribosome to produce a specific amino acid chain which later generates into an active protein and performs its functions in the cell. It's all very complicated but take a moment to look at your body, your hands, the skin, the muscle, the hair, every single part of yourself. Each part of your cells that make up the whole contain millions of proteins. Proteins are molecular building blocks for every organism on earth. But how are they made in the first place? The instructions for making proteins are written in the cell's DNA. In each cell's book of life exists a code or sequence and this is what we call our genes. The first step of generating these proteins from the gene sequence or book is called transcription. Here the DNA sequence of the gene is rewritten in the form of two types of RNA. One of these types of RNA is classified as coding RNA or mRNA, messenger RNA. The second step is called translation. In this stage, the mRNA is decoded in the ribosome to produce a specific protein. The ribosome is a type of micro machine present within all of our cells. Its purpose is to read the instructions presented by the mRNA. The whole process is called gene expression and without mRNA, the ribosome cannot read the genetic sequence of the gene and therefore cannot produce the proteins that make up our biological structure. With this in mind, we can return to the scriptural context of Enoch's translation and David's marvel at God's book. If Enoch or anyone was to obtain a celestial body from a terrestrial body, then one of the first steps would be to change the expression of the genetic code and the proteins produced. And this can only be produced with the right kind of transcription and translation process. I, th I think there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs on the medical front, uh, particularly around the synthetic uh, mRNA. Uh, you can basically do anything with uh, synthetic uh, RNA, DNA. Um, it's, really, it's like a computer program. So, I mean, I think with enough, with, with, uh, with an effort that's not too crazy, you could probably stop aging, reverse it if you want. Um, uh, these are, you can basically do anything. You can turn someone into a freaking butterfly if you want with the right DNA sequence. It could be that Enoch and others raised in a celestial body are resurrected with entirely new genetic DNA. Or it could be a case that the matter of DNA, which we have been programmed to view as a double helix, is actually a lot more complex and perhaps already contains this information, but we lack the specific mRNA translation function to read the specific code and produce the proteins that could transform our bodies from terrestrial to celestial. Either way, the scriptural refrain, it is written, is not to be taken lightly. It is written in our genes and perhaps this is why genetic miscegenation or genetic misappropriation is a sin because it not only corrupts our creator's ordained structure of life but potentially interferes with the process of translation. Perhaps this realm and all human life was created as a testing ground, a transitory phase before gaining access to the celestial realm or other subsequent realms. Who knows? Again, my point here is not to argue that the Bible's distinction between celestial and terrestrial bodies is the truth. How would I know? 
but to demonstrate that the Bible contains a wealth of information on genetics and places genetic corruption as the primary driver behind the Great Flood Reset. And I can hear the skeptics again. So what if our historical ancestors partially understood human genetics and attributed them to God? And so what if scripture tells us that the corruption of human genetics was responsible for the first documented reset in our history? It's just a book, written by humans. It doesn't mean it is the truth. And I can sympathize with this kind of skepticism. After all, the redaction and manipulation of scripture is obvious and no great secret. The problem we are left with, however, is what portions of the text have been changed. How can we rely on these words? And, after all, it is no coincidence that the very same King James, who was responsible for sponsoring the translation of the Bible, also wrote a dissertation on demonology, which leaves the inquisitive mind with many suspicions. And perhaps I would have agreed with our skeptic a long time ago. However, we live in a world of tremendous deception. And all we can rely on are our own eyes. And what do we see? There is a war going on back home, viewer. How is it being fought? What do you see taking place? Many are being led by the petulant poison of the snake's tongue to fool them into committing an irreversible action and to live through the consequences alone. Even if what they are telling us is not the truth, even if they do not actually function with this kind of technology and they operate differently, they are reveling in the notion that they do function this way. And again, the why is more important than the what. Why are they doing this? What are they trying to accomplish? All we need to do is put their narrative in the context of scripture and it becomes pretty clear where their leadership and inspiration is coming from. A war on the integrity of our genetics and the act of creation itself with the intention to corrupt and ultimately destroy. An outright attack on God's book. And while they have redacted so much of scripture, it would also be naive to assume they would not leave things hiding in plain sight. It is not like the account of genetic miscegenation and the subsequent great flood is comprehensive. It is a small, elusive chapter, and they have worked hard to mythologize it ever since, to Disneyfy it. And if you apply common sense and logical thinking, then the mere existence of the sophisticated and almost machine-like complexity of genetic sequencing and expression in and of itself destabilizes the notion of evolution. It is absurd to believe that the precision of our genetics evolved so sophisticatedly over time that through trial and error, the result was a process in which allowed DNA to be transcripted into RNA and produce mRNA, which contains codons or a code that can be edited and read by the ribosome, the molecular machine found within all of our cells, and through the act of reading this code, produces the proteins necessary for life. No, the most simple answer is that we have a creator, someone, or something wrote the code, wrote the book of life, it is written. And it's not difficult to see why many end up pertaining to the perspective that reality, our existence and experience within this realm is akin to a computer simulation. After all, our very own genetics function like very sophisticated computer programming and coding. And after all, mathematics, the clockwork of our realm, and the sacred geometry underpinning its core energetics lies behind everything. But an important distinction must be made. A computer simulation is man-made. It is primitive and the result of the artificial intelligence that we ourselves have created. God is not akin to artificial intelligence. God is authentic intelligence. 
There is not a single imitation in our realm that has come close to producing such an outstanding form of simulation. And perhaps that's why they attack God and his book of life so fervently. The enemy is jealous and suffering a type of inferiority complex. When one has aspirations to be great, to be like the most high, of course a natural type of envy will arise in that individual, especially if their ambitions are to create a realm of artificial intelligence, a simulation they have full control over and their opponent is an authentic intelligence of the most sublime standard. And if such an individual allows themselves to be consumed by their envy, then of course, a monomaniacal obsession to destroy and corrupt their opponent's creation will arise within them. And it's here that their favorite number needs discussing. 666 or the Mark of the Beast really in essence relates to a species propensity to play the creator, to play God. It is actually more appropriate to call this sequence of sixes the Prometheus Code. In ancient Greek mythology, Prometheus is credited with the creation of humanity from clay and of defying the gods by stealing fire and giving it to humanity. During the concluding stages of the Great Reset in the 19th century, Prometheus became regarded as a figure who represented human striving, particularly the quest for scientific knowledge and the risk of overreaching or unintended consequences. In particular, he was regarded as embodying the lone genius whose efforts to improve human existence could only result in tragedy. On some level or another, everything in existence creates. All species procreate. We are creative beings, producing artistic expressions and interpretations of our experience of reality. We create homes, gardens, transportation, businesses and so on. And perhaps this is the true meaning of the phrase, God made man in his image. We are supposed to create and revel in the often paradoxical joy and pain of such an act, but only within the perimeter of God's ordained order. When we transgress this ordained order, things become problematic and usually end in tragic suffering. Actions have consequences. If God's creation accumulated and finished with the number seven on the seventh day, then six falls short by one. It is incomplete. It is a number not necessarily of a specific man, but of man itself. Of man's attempts to play God but falling short. Of not possessing the divine conclusion and finale of seven. And it's right there in chapter six of Genesis. Chapter 6 of Genesis recounts God's displeasure with the state of humanity, of humanity's willingness to corrupt their genetics under the leadership of the hybrid Nephilim. Thematically, Chapter 6 is all about the tension between natural, ordained creation and a Promethean type of creation. The chapter is 22 verses long. Out of 22, there are only two more verses which provide us a sum of six, specifically verse six and verse 15. And both these verses focus on the act of creation itself. In verse six, it grieves the Lord that he had made man on the earth because of man's innate Promethean nature. And verse 15 details Noah's creation of the ark itself. And interestingly, the flood was sent when Methuselah died at the age of 969. Again, it's right there in the number. The two nines are inverted sixes. The inversion here breaks the Prometheus code of 666. It was the flood that broke and inverted the Promethean state of humanity. The Prometheus Code signals an aspiration to subvert and pervert God's natural order of creation. It has subsequently become associated with the devil, but its true signaling is satanic if we are to understand Satan through the Hebrew root of the word, which means adversary. It is in opposition to God's order. 
The Prometheus Code, or Mark of the Beast, doesn't just refer to a particular event in which people could not buy or sell without having a specific mark on them. It refers to the entire beast system of distorted and corrupted reality that we are born into and remain in until we die. And this is really what's at heart when we see reference to the Prometheus Code. When the controllers and their puppets integrate this sequence of sixes into their narrative and lies, it is a deliberate hiding in plain sight, their own little sick joke, and their own way of telling us and gaining informed consent. They want us to subconsciously accept their efforts of playing God, to blindly accept their beast system. They unashamedly want us to know where their inspiration is coming from that they are playing the architect of our perceived reality. If the Bible contains 66 books, then it means at some point they played the creator and removed the other books. And they make it obvious for us, because they try to play a fair game of good versus evil. If they didn't have their own way of telling us and giving us a choice to know, a choice to accept or reject, if they just imposed it upon us, then what are they? Dictators. Parading their code in plain sight is their cowardly idea of playing fairly. And if we are too lazy to investigate things properly ourselves and learn the history outlined in scripture, then more fool us. And this coded sequence is so prevalent, so interwoven into the very fabric of the matrix that governs our perception of reality, that to dismiss it as mere coincidence is naive. It is a mathematical sequence underlying the prism lodged firmly in our minds. For example, in the heliocentric model, Earth's average orbital speed around the Sun is 66,616 miles per hour. Earth's axial tilt measures at 23.4 degrees, which leaves us with a remaining 66.6 degrees. The Arctic and Antarctic circles are located at 66 degrees north and south of the equator respectively. Mercury has been classified as the 66th most abundant metal on Earth. Carbon has an atomic number of 6 and carbon-12 has 6 electrons, 6 protons and 6 neutrons. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day. 2 plus 4 is 6. The tropic lines of latitude are drifting at a rate of 15 meters per year. At this rate, it takes 66.66 years to move a kilometer on the Earth. And in case you did not notice, an astronomical or precessional age, which has been estimated at 2,160 years, is the sum of 6 times 6 times 60. Yes, that's correct. Please forgive me, viewer, but I have to tell the story in this way. I have introduced a very basic model of our realm, with thanks to Sturgios, but we will be returning to it later to really nuance its implications. There is something fundamentally missing here, something I have deliberately withheld for later. Our journey is going to be a long one. But for now, a riddle. There is a thing that nothing is, and yet it has a name. It is sometimes tall and sometimes short, joins our talks, joins our sport, and plays at every game. The Prometheus Code offers us a way of navigating through the deception. It is our way marker. When we stumble across it, or unearth it, it really does require us to dig a lot deeper, and try and locate what is buried beneath its deceptive facade. It means they are playing God, whether they are deceiving us about a fundamental aspect of our reality, creation, or an aspect integral to both. And a question remains, can the Prometheus Code lead us to a better understanding as to the corruption of genetics in the antediluvian era, and the vast dichotomy between the biological differences between human life in that era and our own present time? 
There is one glaringly obvious conundrum present in the Bible's description of the antediluvian world. If human and angelic species shared similar genetics, in the sense that they are both at once distinct, but both similar enough to reproduce, then how on earth were gargantuan giants spawned? It is not possible for a human woman as we know her to produce gigantic beings. In the Islamic Hadith, it states that God created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall. That number again. And this is interesting because the Bible omits reference to the height of Adam, Eve, and those that followed. If Adam was 60 cubits tall, then this would make Adam roughly 90 foot tall. And if we align the Hadith with the Bible, then reference to Adam's height of 60 cubits reveals a deception. They must have redacted this information from the Bible. Whether 60 cubits tall or otherwise, the humans of the antediluvian past represented in scripture were generally much larger than us. And the Bible tells us that the antediluvian patriarchs lived much longer lives. Noah was 950 when he died. Methuselah was 969. And with this information in mind, then the concluding verses of chapter 5 of the apocryphal 2 Esdras make sense. Ask a woman that beareth children, and she shall tell thee, say unto her, Wherefore are unto they, whom thou hast now brought forth like those that were before, but less of stature? And she shall answer thee, They that be born in the strength of youth are of one fashion, and they that are born in the time of age, when the womb faileth, are otherwise. Consider thou therefore also, how that ye are less of stature than those that were before you, and so are they that come after you less than ye. As the passage makes clear, those conceived in the prime of youth, in the prime of fertility, tend to be born and grow to have a taller stature, because the womb is not failing. If humans in general lived for much larger lifespans in the antediluvian era, then the time period of the woman's youth, or prime, would have been much longer. With the implications of Adam's height in mind, this starts to make a little bit more sense. All species in the antediluvian world were generally much larger, and the hybrid Nephilim offspring were the largest of them all. Before the flood was sent, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Before the flood, humans lived tremendous lifespans, but after that decreased to a hundred and twenty years, and continued to decrease. Something changed in the earth's atmosphere that meant that humans would not live as long or grow as high. But what changed? Interestingly, it is the apocryphal book of Enoch and the book of giants that offers us some clues. The first English translation of the Ethiopic manuscripts of Enoch, held in Oxford's Bodleian Library, was published in 1821 by Richard Lawrence. Curiously, Lawrence's translation was swiftly superseded by his own further translations and other editions due to the discovery of better texts and the employment of better critical methods, we are told. I have read many translations of the Ethiopic text, and there is one glaringly obvious difference between them and Lawrence's original translation, and it's located in chapter 66. That number again. All subsequent translations of this chapter relate how God, before the flood, instructed his angels to keep the waters of the great deep suppressed until the right moment. And the Lord gave commandment to the angels, who were going out, that they should not cause the waters to rise, but should hold them in check. But in Lawrence's translation, there are extra verses, and in verse 2, God instructs the angels to labour at the trees, to cut them down. Reference to the destruction of trees appears again in all translations, but this time only in chapter 83. 
which is featured in the book of visions and dreams and recounts the destruction of the earth and how the high trees were rent from their stems and hurled down and sunk in the abyss. And it's curious that Lawrence's translation of chapter 66 is not reproduced in the more widely popular translations and the only reference to the destruction of trees delegated to a section on visions. You know, those things that aren't necessarily true. And what's even more curious is the Book of Giants. The Book of Giants is a very succinct series of almost incomprehensible fragments. These fragments primarily reiterate the corruption of the earth, as outlined in both Genesis and Enoch, but also relate the nightmares of specific hybrid giants in the lead up to the incoming flood. Now troubled with disturbing nightmares, one hybrid giant named Marwe reports his dream to the rest of the giants, in which he sees a tablet inscribed with several names immersed in water, and as it emerges only three names remain inscribed. The usual interpretation is that this symbolizes the death of all of those on earth by the flood except Noah and his sons. Another hybrid giant Oyar has a similar dream. Then Oya said to him, I have been forced to have a dream. The sleep of my eyes vanished so that I could see a vision. Now I know that on the field of battle we cannot win. I saw a tree uprooted, except for three of its roots. While I was as it were watching, some beings moved all the roots into this garden, but not the three. Just like in Enoch, we are given yet another dream vision of angelic beings uprooting trees. And that's not all. Throughout the entirety of the Bible, the Nephilim hybrids are figuratively described as trees. In one of the most brilliantly rich chapters of the entire Bible, chapter 31 of Ezekiel, the Pharaoh king of Egypt is compared to an earlier king, the Assyrian angelic Nephilim king who ruled the antediluvian world and his fallen corrupted kingdom. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon, with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of high stature. His height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied. Under his shadow dwelt all the great nations. In Amos 2, the Amorites, a race of people ruled by the Nephilim kings Og and Sion, are compared to the cedar trees. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And so what? We are, after all, reading literature, and writers employ figurative language, simile and metaphor at their will to tell their tale. But, we are not dealing with ordinary literature here. The Bible is one of the most magnificent, cryptic, profound pieces of writing in existence, and it is because of its utter power that it has been redacted and edited. Would the controllers, who deal in deception, really hand us over historical accounts neatly intact for us to learn the truth? And like I said before, it does not mean that there is not an abundance of truth within scripture, it just means we need to work harder to draw it to the surface. It's almost as if the Bible silently beckons us to decipher the truth hidden within its tangled tapestry of rich, figurative language. Returning to Ezekiel 31, the account of the Assyrian king continues. We come to learn that the antediluvian Nephilim king breached the Garden of Eden and assumed control. Ezekiel 31 contains the most references to the Garden than any other chapter in the Bible. When humans were banished from Eden, the apostate angels occupied the Garden, and one of those apostate fallen angels, termed here as the Assyrian, ruled the earth from this location. The cedars in the Garden of God, i.e. the other Nephilim giants in Eden, could not hide him and could not control him, so he was cut down. Thus saith the Lord, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all of the trees of the field fainted for him. 
This is the same account as in Enoch 66, where we find the angels keeping the waters of the great deep suppressed while they cut down the trees. In a line in Ezekiel 31, with Lawrence's early translation of Enoch 66, we unearth the potential deception. We realize that what Enoch 66 explicitly states, that the angels labored at the trees and cut them down, the Bible dissolves into the very fabric of metaphor and simile itself to describe the Nephilim. The Bible uses the image of the tree as a way to describe the Nephilim's height, whereas in Enoch, physical trees of enormous size are literally cut down. And it's strange that Lawrence's extra verses in chapter 66 are not more widely reproduced. They do not want us to consider that at some point in our history, there were literally gigantic physical trees on earth. They do not remove the gigantic tree imagery here completely. That would not be fair play, so they integrate it as a metaphor to describe the Nephilim themselves. It would almost be too easy for the skeptic when presented with the almost inconceivable reality of a structure like Devil's Tower and other basalt columnar wonders of the world. They would burst out laughing, sneer and decry that you have a bad case of pareidolia, the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on nebulous stimulus, usually visual, so that one sees an object, pattern or meaning where there is none. But the skeptic's arrogant grin would pop and deflate fairly swiftly when asked to provide a sufficient explanation for the structure's almost perfect hexagonal geometry. Still to this day, no one has provided a proper and sufficient explanation for this phenomenon, and the official narrative of cooling lava flow is nothing more than a satanic mockery. The basalt columns are petrified geometric masterpieces displaying hexagonal polygons with little or no angle defect. Similar displays of geometry are found in crystalline matter and the bee's honeycomb lattice. This is not solidified lava flow, and the skeptic knows it, they won't admit it, but they know deep within their core of being. The basalt columns and other similar structures stand as the primary remaining evidence that living organic matter used to be much, much larger in our realm's history. They stand as broken, petrified remnants testifying silently to our realm's mysterious past, beautiful wonders that beg the curious to ask what on earth happened. If there were gigantic trees in the antediluvian era, and also gigantic beings, then the act of cutting them down before the incoming flood also makes sense. It would have prevented the Nephilim from using them to ascend and avoid perishing. They also offer an explanation to the vastly different atmospheric and biochemical conditions that could have existed in our Earth's history and enabled life to grow much larger and live much longer. In a world of gigantic trees, the entire chemical structure of our atmosphere, its oxygen and carbon dioxide levels would have been drastically different. We will be returning to the basalt columns later. They are very important, but it's getting late. Why have I told you this story? You're dying to ask the question, am I implying that these structures belong to the antediluvian era? Am I implying that the mud flood was the great flood? For now, let's just say it's complicated, and I want you to make your own mind up as we continue. Our eyes alone tell us that whoever built these structures were much larger than us, that much is obvious. And all it takes is proper consideration of the size of these structures, of the enormous doors and gates to ascertain this. But the mud, this was not the great flood. And yes, we can see with our own eyes that the ground level has been raised, but we can also see that the majority of these structures remain intact, undamaged, preserved. The great antediluvian flood does not appropriately explain what we see here, nor does soil liquefaction from simultaneous earthquake events 
or any other kind of cataclysm for that matter. The so-called mud flood was something else. In one respect, it was something quite obvious, but in another, it is entirely mysterious, and you'll see soon enough. You'll also see that there is a thread that ties this all to the antediluvian era. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and ruin the story. Things will become much clearer as we continue our journey. And as I said before, I have broadly introduced the story I am trying to tell, but it's not enough not quite right and i hope you forgive me but i had to introduce a story this way to paint the picture in your mind before i tear it all down and bring us a little closer to a more solid understanding of our lost history and in order to do this we need to locate a number of hidden keys they are waiting for us and we cannot continue without them we need to unlock certain doors I have one with me right now, one of the most important keys, but we will need to journey on to find the rest. History is a nightmare from which we are all trying to awake from. Can you hear the distant drumbeat of the Promethean beast system? The skeptics in their great slumber would not readily sacrifice the genetic integrity of their bodies if they really knew the potential consequences. The fear of death is a great motivator. It's a tremendous shame, however, that a love of life itself, a love for one's genetic integrity, and a love for God's book no longer motivates the masses. It is almost incomprehensible as to how complacent humans have become. And yet it will be in the final hour that they will panic and turn on the very people who try to warn them for so long. How will the future of humanity unfold now a great line has been crossed? Will another flood come to deliver judgment? The atmospheric conditions of our realm were different in the antediluvian world. Scripture tells us that it did not rain like it does in our current day, but that a great mist watered the earth back then. The flood and the subsequent rise in ocean levels changed that, and God established his covenant, the rainbow in the sky, with man as a promise he would not flood the earth again. I don't think a great flood is coming, but a storm viewer, well that's a different entity entirely, isn't it? That's electric. I've kept you for too long. Rest now, and I will continue working to get us back on track. Wait, what's wrong? I can see that you're troubled. Something is bothering you. Ah, you want to tell me about the nightmare you were having. I know what you saw. You saw the asylums and great fire. Let's hope it was just a dream and not a premonition. Rest now. Keep pondering everything. If I haven't fixed this thing by the time you awaken, then we will discuss the first key. Unlocking the first door will be a complex task, but once we've done it, your entire understanding of our lost history will begin to change.
In case you find these videos useful, please share them with others so we can help them too. Subscribe and hit the bell icon for more videos and updates. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Peace.